Okay, I want to talk to you today about the endocannabinoid system. So, to preface uh, everything so far based on the previous videos and what we're working on here, we're trying to work out what the primary driver is of modern day obesity. We know a couple things. We know that you need to increase hunger and you need to decrease metabolism and you need to pathologically do those two things at the same time over a long period of time. So they typically happen at the same time. Hormones that downregulate your metabolism or upregulate your hunger, that's just how we've evolved. But fundamentally we need to do pathologically. Now, the other thing here is when I've been looking at these different systems, cellular systems, hormonal systems, that could potentially be a driver of this stuff, the other stuff I've been trying to work out is how is the microbiome involved? There are um, case reports of microbiomes, transplants, basically completely messing up uh, someone's system, making them obese. Also, um, yeah, how's the microbiome involved? How are the hunger hormones involved? What do you do about food addiction and a huge dysregulated hormone and uh, dopamine spikes? Um, and then fundamentally, yeah, coming back to this idea that like calories in, calories out is an observable result but fundamentally, something is happening that is causing somebody to eat more calories than they need and put out less calories than they want to or need as well. Otherwise, in homeostasis, you can overfeed humans and their metabolic rates will increase and you don't get obesity. So, we're going to talk about the endocannabinoid system. What is it? It's a system that is understood to a well to a pretty decent degree but still very very uh there's a lot of questions that aren't, aren't are not answered it's very misunderstood we discovered it kind of 20 30 years ago when we were trying to understand how cannabis or marijuana works and a cannabinoid um, and fundamentally what drives the psychoactive element of that what drives the hunger related to that and here's how it works <clears throat> you have cv1 receptors and you have cv2 receptors in your body and they can be activated and they can be turned off so we have CB1 receptors, they're mainly in the brain, but also they're in your gut and your digestive system. You have CB2 receptors, they're mainly in your organs and immune cells. And together they regulate thermogenesis, which is how your body uh, creates heat from energy substrate, energy expenditure and your resting metabolic rate, your food intake, your hunger hormones, uh, again, energy expenditure, so your metabolism, which is the other side of that. Uh, levels of information in your body, also the constituency of your microbiome uh, and your mood. Now I've emboldened the CB1 receptor because fundamentally CB1 receptors wildly outnumber CB2 receptors in your body and so a lot of the work goes into CB1 receptors. If you produced you know, things that touch both receptors at any given time, because there are so many more receptors, CB1 receptors, it will always have an outsized impact on CB1. The other thing here, you'll see this number, I'm going to share the link to this mirror, uh, to this uh, Figma board with the video um, numbers relate to references. I have all the references in another slide at the bottom here. Okay, so you can do two things with these receptors, CB1 and CB2. You can basically turn them on, so activate them, hit them, or block them from being turned on. That's the mental model that we need here. So what happens if you turn them on and what happens when you block them? So it is known and clinically proven with CB1. If you turn on the CB1 receptor, you can trigger excessive hunger in humans. You can induce drug seeking behavior. You can create addictive dopamine loops. So this goes back to like food addiction. We found with CB1, uh, CB1 receptor being activated when people take opioids, when they uh, smoke marijuana, when they drink alcohol, and when they eat highly, pal highly palatable uh, ultra processed foods. All of those things produce endocannabinoids. Fundamentally, high processed foods is really seed oils. Um, but it will mean that there's a reinforcing dopamine spike. So you eat that thing and you create a dopamine pathway that will then make you crave more ultra processed food subconsciously and go seek out. Uh, it will increase fat generation, which is uh, so de, novo, de novo lipogenesis, which is actually taking carbohydrate substrate in your body and creating bodily saturated fat from it. So if you turn on CB1 and you're eating carbs, the calorie isn't a calorie. Your body will preferentially create more body fat from that as opposed to actually burning it for energy. It will reduce your resting metabolic rate, reduce your metabolism. Now the stuff here that is in italics and not boldened is just a bit more technical, um, but I had it here. It loosens the gut wall. So when you turn on CB1, your gut wall is one uh, cell thick, I think, and it actually loosens the, 
the tightness between those cells and so you can get more like pathogens uh, that come into your gut uh, and that fundamentally like, ch yeah, changes your intestinal permeability and has huge inflammation and microbiome implications. It will induce leptin resistance and decrease ad adiponectin. Su it's suggested that they happen at the same time, like or could be the same thing. So leptin is the hormone that your body fat produces to tell your brain, hey, we're carrying 20 pounds of body fat. You can speed up your metabolism. You can lower your hunger. We have all this energy. We're going to use it. And uh, you can actually become resistant or blind to leptin. And adiponectin, which is also released from your body fat, will uh, make you not blind or make you see your leptin. So as you decrease out ad adiponectin, you will automatically become leptin resistant. If you can turn on CB1, it limits inflammation. It can reduce food intake. It will reduce. Uh, it will reduce weight gain. It will increase your metabolism, and it does that fundamentally by browning your fat. So as you store, you can store fat as white fat, which is just like literally dead fat storage on your body. And you can brown your fat through activating CB1, and I think the other thing you can do is like cold plunges and actually grows mitochondria inside of your fat cells and then it will uh, your fat becomes an organ that creates heat energy from the fat itself, which is really cool. <clears throat> then you can block CB1. So if you block CB1, we know that that will reduce your food intake, it will reduce weight gain, it will increase your metabolism, it will reduce inflammation, reduce craving and addiction relapse. So you can block CB1 and people will reduce addiction relapse for drinking alcohol, uh, drinking opioids, food, cannabis. Uh, it will increase, uh, improve your insulin, improve insulin resistance, that's reducing insulin resistance. Increases Acromantia mucinophila, which is something, uh, is a microbiome population we like to talk about a lot now, but you basically need Acromantia to create GLP-1 releases in your, in your digestive system. And a lot of people are lacking in this, so this actually will increase that. Uh, it lowers intestinal permeability, so it makes those gut junctions a lot tighter. And then what that does is it reduces endotoxemia and also reduces, this is a bad uh, bacteria population that we don't want. Um, improves hypoglycemia, that's uh, diabetes basically. It will brown your fat as well and it will restore that insensitivity. You can block CB2, pretty hard to do, very not very well documented, but that will increase inflammation. Okay, so now we know what the endocannabinoid system does with these two receptors. So how do we turn them on and what does that mean? So you can turn them on fundamentally and primarily they're turned on through two key endocannabinoids, 2-AG and AEA. Endocannabinoids are products of dietary fatty acids in this case. Modulation of, of cannabinoid receptor function can occur via modification of dietary fatty acids. So the, the composition of the fat that you eat will change the uh, receptors, the receptor function and the actual endocannabinoids that are produced. Fundamentally, linoleic acid is easily converted in the body into ar ar arachidonic acid, and arachidonic acid is then converted into AEA via several pathways. That is absolutely the majority piece where uh, your the primary and endocannabinoid produces AEA, and the primary place it's, can, it's produced from is linoleic acid, and that happens in your digestion, that actually happens in your gut. Uh, and then that will trigger, well we'll get there in a sec, dietary fats are the only source of fatty acids required for synthesis of endocannabinoids. So you don't need other things. You don't need other nutrients, you don't need other minerals. You can literally take linoleic acid, take glugs of the thing, and you will see a spike in AEA and 2-AG. And both of them are CB1 agonists. What's an agonist? It turns on. So both of those things, 2-AG and AEA, turn this on. Right? Linoleic acid, arachidonic acid, creates AEA, turns this on. Um, a, 2-AG is a CB2 agonist, which turns, uh, yeah, in theory, like it does this, but again, we were talking about the number of CB1 and CB2 receptors, such as like, this is basically non-existent. Okay, so that's turning them on. How do we block them? What do we know about blocking them? In theory, if turning them on does do this, and we know that if we can block them, these things happen, like they are the inverse of each other, we should see some clinical evidence of that, and we do. So if we block CB1 and we activate CB2, we should see great things. We do see great things. Gastric bypass surgery basically blocks CB1 in the gut. It takes your gut and it reroutes it outside of your stomach, outside of the first part of your intestine and further on. You still eat food, you still digest those calories and can assimilate those calories in your body, but it skips the CB1 receptors for the primary pathway there in your digestive system. And what happens when you have gastric bypass surgery, your fat 
brown, so it will brown your fat, it will increase your resting metabolic rate, and it will reverse obesity. That's probably the primary surgical intervention that's successful right now. Um, comes with a bunch of complications and some suicide risk, but and it's very expensive as well. Then we have this drug called Ramonaban. So somebody basically discovering the endocrine anabolic system, doing some experiments about 20 years ago, said, hey, why don't we block CB1 and see what happens. So Ramonaban was a successful anti-obesity drug and a CB1 blocker. It's actually arguably the most successful anti-obesity drug ever invented. When people took it, it stopped them smoking. So addiction, right? It reversed obesity, reversed drug-seeking behavior as well. So it killed food addiction. People are no longer looking for high reward trash calories they start eating a lot healthier when they take the drug and they also lose enormous amounts of weight the metabolism is unblocked and they are free to kind of eat with a lot more sense and thirdly we've seen also in humans um, cbd and thcv are cannabinoids it's like plant cannabinoids they block the cb1 receptor so uh, psychoactive part of marijuana is thc you also have thcv which is not psychoactive and uh, the psychoactive part of marijuana, THC, is a CB1 agonist. It turns it on. That's where you get the munchies when you smoke certain strains of weed. CBD and THCV will block your CB1. And it's been shown, yeah, that it's been shown if you uh, take um, certain doses of this, it will increase your metabolic rate. It will brown your fat, which is what we want. Fantastic. And uh, clinically, it led to a nine, nine pound weight loss over 90 days with no, nothing else changing, just the group taking it versus the control had to just take the strip with CBD and THCV. So we know turning them on, bad. Blocking them, totally works, which also means that turning them on is definitely bad. So <clears throat> we do know fundamentally in the human body they're turned on from fat. So should we get rid of fat? No, we shouldn't get rid of fat. We actually know that even in low fat diets, you can still create huge amounts of the two endocannabinoids and uh, turn on this machine. So we know that when we feed mice low fat diets, so 12% of caloric uh, volume is coming from fat, but ramp up the linoleic acid content up to about 8% of calories in an isocaloric diet, it will elevate 2-AG and AEA production. It makes their fat cells bigger, it makes their fat inflamed, and it leads to greater weight gain. And then on the inverse of this, if you change the dietary fat, uh, like intake. Endocannabinoids can be produced from monounsaturated fat and saturated fat, and they have an anorexic effect in mice. So oleothanolamide, oleothanolamide, OEA, is produced from olive oil when you eat olive oil, or stereothanolamide, it's SEA, is produced when you eat animal fats or heavy cream or butter. Um, and SEA basically well, it definitely has an anorexic effect in starved mice. They just aren't interested in food. And OEA, I would say there's much more than an anecdote of saying it's kind of now advised by most wellness people. Take a glug of olive oil and you will see a prolonged suppression of your, uh, of your hunger and an increase in your metabolic rate. So to conclude, I'll, I'll, you can see the references by yourself. But to conclude, we know this system. We know a lot about the system. So what happens with this system? This is what happens with the system. You eat linoleic acid. You eat a lot of linoleic acid. You only need 8% of your calories from linoleic acid, which is what probably 90% of Americans do. You produce AEA en masse. That turns on your CB1 receptor. That's just like smashing that button. But really, it's not smashing the button. It is putting a large weight on your CB1 receptor and turning on that system for prolonged and pathological use. And what happens? You end up with ravenous hunger. You end up with food addiction, which is comparable to opioid addiction, alcohol addiction, and smoking addiction. That is, in and of itself, the thing that sells this to me. You turn on food addiction. You will generate more fat from the carbohydrates that you're eating. So you're actually stealing energy that you've eaten and storing it as fat, as opposed to being able to burn it off. It will weaken your gut lining and destroy your microbiome. This is a massive missing link in a lot of the food discourse, uh, food or obesity cause discourse. And this, this is huge to me and it reduces your metabolism. So if you wanna avoid obesity, the primary driver of obesity in modern day America or in the West is the su successful and incessant activation of the endocannabinoid system. Thanks.